Well, I'm Mike Norton. I'm a professor at Tokyo Institute of Technology, and I'm also Environment Program Director for ESAC. My job is to look after the Environment Program, manage the projects, the expert, work with the experts, and finalise the report focused at the European Union and the European Parliament. Well, we keep a watching brief on all environmental issues, which might have a European dimension. And um, there was a, a feeling after the Paris Agreement over two years ago now that uh, it wasn't fully realised how serious a challenge meeting those targets was. And over the last two years, it's become apparent that a lot of people thought that the question of climate change had been solved just by that agreement. And they'd rather forgotten about these severe challenges to emissions. And that one of the possible reasons for this was a, a, a belief that since we have so many technological advances which has popped out of people's out imaginations in different fields, somehow something would come out in 2050 which would solve the problem for us. And we decided to look at that to see if that was really the case and whether that really could um, compensate for the rather slow pace of emissions reductions which countries are actually managing to achieve. Well, as you say, IPC scenarios have rather fed that um, belief in the f future solving our current problems because it's very easy to put a, a technology which sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into a, into a future model and find out what effects removing so many gigatons of carbon would have on future temperature profiles. And that rather has a feedback loop to politics in that sense if someone thinks that there's a future scenario which is believable and beneficial, maybe we don't have to try so hard today. But uh, our conclusions is, and we looked at uh, seven different aspects of these technologies, our conclusions was that there's no silver bullet and this will not remedy the current uh, weakness in our mitigation pathways. And that, therefore, if we don't mitigate carbon dioxide emissions now and rather urgently, we are going to be heading for a dangerously warming world by the middle to late century. Well, we group them into uh, seven in each, in, in the report, which is here. Uh, we have seven annexes which go into them in detail. And then in the main body of the report, we summarize the, the positive and negative aspects and make some sort of realistic assessment of how much they could produce. Um, going in order, the first one is afforestation and reforestation. Well, that's worth doing anyway, because it does. Uh, it is really a mitigation, because um, regenerating forests absorbs carbon from the atmosphere, stops it raising CO2 levels, and if it's done ni nicely, it can also contribute to biodiversity. So there's nothing wrong with that, but we can't, don't see it as a way of sucking gigatons of carbon out uh, as, a as a negative emission technology. One of the reasons there is that it's not in there long enough. You can't guarantee that carbon stays in the forest for the 100 or 200 or longer that you need for it to be a negative emission technology. Then the next one will be land management, where you try and increase the carbon content of the soil. That, again, is worth doing because it actually improves the agricultural quality of the soil. So we're certainly in favour of that. And there is an initiative, the 4 per mil initiative, which came from Paris, which uh, we fully support. But again, it doesn't deliver you these huge gigaton removals that um, w are required for in the various future models. Then there's extended weathering, which is when you try and grind up rocks and spread them over the, over the land uh, to speed up the rate at which they suck out carbon dioxide. That's very slow, and it's not yet demonstrated whether it'll work and on what scale you can work in. And what we found is uh, in a lot of these technologies, applying these technologies requires a huge amount of resources and energy. Where is that energy going to come from without generating even more carbon dioxide? Where is the land going to come from when you've already got pressures on land between population pressures, agriculture, protecting biodiversity, and these other factors? So a lot of these things have a lot of internal conflicts built into the system which are not always recognised when you look at just one of the technologies on their own. Moving on, 
we go through this uh, famous one, Beck's uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is the main model to have featured in IPCC scenarios, we find that is equally faultily f um, based on this concept of carbon neutrality, which is very case specific and not general. And that's what's driven this whole problem with the bioenergy use being encouraged in the European Union which is encouraging forests to be cut down in America to ship them to the UK or Holland to burn just because they can claim their zero emissions for no real uh, scientific reason. We see similar dangers in BEX, um, not only on, this, on the aspect of the providing the biomass in a way that actually doesn't generate more greenhouse gases, but also in the fact we don't have carbon capture and storage yet. So applying that as an as a off-the-shelf technology is still very speculative. And we can see lots of cases in which pe case BEX would not achieve anything like the removal rates that are seen f in some of the models. Then, this is getting a long list, I'm sorry, but um, then uh, we look at ocean fertilization, which is sprinkling iron in the areas of the ocean where there's already enough main nutrients. This does work. I mean, it does stimulate algal blooms, but sometimes they're not the right ones. Sometimes they're poisonous, uh, potentially significant disruption to the marine, marine ecosystem. And it's still not clear to what extent the initial absorption when the plankton grow is not just returned to the atmosphere within a few days or weeks through natural processes. So again, a high risk without any certainty on the amount of carbon removed. And then the final one is uh, not a negative emission technology itself, but it, it really affects the degree to which those technologies will be required. And that's capturing carbon from sources that um, e emit carbon on a very large route, that's power stations, cement, chemical industries. There we've got a huge amount of carbon dioxide in the, in the flue gases which can be captured but we haven't yet got the scale up and the experience to do that efficiently or even trouble free and the original plans to have a lot of demonstration projects going by now have all got stalled and so we're losing that opportunity. And that leads me to the final one, which is direct air capture, which is where you're trying to suck carbon dioxide from the very dilute state it is in the atmosphere. Again, that chemically will work, but again, what is the point of absorbing carbon dioxide from an extremely dilute source when you ha already haven't managed to extract it from these highly concentrated sources I just talked about? So when you add it all up, there are potentials for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but the sort of targets in, involved in models of 10 gigatons per year or more just don't add up to a credible scenario in our view. So th that, that, that is our conclusion. Well, the key messages in our report are that <coughs> You can't rely on the future to f solve the problems of the current situation. So the focus should very much be focused on mitigation, reducing um, carbon emissions as much as possible, and a lot faster than they are currently in the plans to do so. Part of that jigsaw puzzle is carbon capture and storage. <clears throat> that would be the next key priority, because if we're not able to capture carbon in significant quantities, then it's going to raise the demands on other sources of mitigation quite substantially. It's going to mean, can we really um, rely on just the current m sh pace of wind and solar in renewables to deliver the mitigation targets we need? And I think our answer is no, no you can't. So you do really need to establish whether CCS is viable as an urgent matter and that has direct implications for EU policy because EU policy used to be very much focused on testing CCS. It's all run into the sand for various reasons. We identify some of those reasons, which I won't go into now, but that needs to be re-energised and restarted. 
then because <coughs> the gap between where we want to be and the where we where we are likely to be in terms of emissions by the mid-century is so big, we can't avoid any possibilities. So even though our current assessment is that these technologies do not have sufficient potential, we still need to carry out research to really check whether that's going to be the case in 20, 30 years time, or whether we may be able to develop some to the point where they can absorb hundreds of millions of tons, which, which can still help even though it doesn't solve the problem. Um, that's an interesting uh, question and um, I wouldn't have had an answer to that uh, um, two weeks ago. Um, our conclusion from the European perspective is that the fundamental problem here is that there's still are almost no value to removing carbon economically. The European Emission Trading Scheme has a carbon price and it's still down at five euros a, a tonne or some very low level. If that price were to be up at 30 to 40 euros a tonne, then private sector would focus on ways of removing carbon dioxide through mitigation and also potential negative emissions. Ironically, one of the side effects of President Trump's tax reform was that a coalition of uh, industry and environmental groups put in quite a heavy tax credit for CCS and also for direct air capture. So with financial incentives in there, it's quite likely that the US will increase its lead in terms of demonstration plants and technology evaluation for CCS and DAC, while the Europe programs are 100% are stalled. So globally, it, and rather ironically in the case of the current administration, there is a, a financial incentive being slipped in with a potentially environmental benefit. So that was the big change that's happened in the last two weeks.